Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Anna Bolog and I'm going to teach this physical geology class at Virginia Western Community College. Uh, I want to welcome all of you. We are starting with the very first module, which is the dynamic earth. I hope a lot of you have thought about geology, the class you are taking this semester, and I hope you all realize that geology is extremely lovable. Actually, it's one of the coolest science class you can possibly take because every aspect of geology is related to everyday lives. Let's see some examples. If you think about the composition of the earth, if you think about the the processes which are forming the earth, which are producing amazing stuff like metals, elements we need, uh, the oil, the gas, the energy resources, the water we drink. Uh, we couldn't use anything. We couldn't build houses without geology, if you think. We couldn't drive our cars. We wouldn't have computers. And just right here, I am going to show you how energy relates to geology. Just think about what kind of energy sources we have, like the solar. It's important that we put together uh, equipments with which we can we can uh, gather the solar energy and use it to heat or, or use as electricity for our houses. We, we have to use the nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the uranium and, and that comes from our earth, of course, the coal. You know that that is uh, the product of, of ancient life. The wind, the wind energy relates to the climate, the, the deep oceanic currents. So that also relates to geology. Of course, water is big time geology. The biomass, that relates to geology as, as the plants using um, the soil for getting all the elements and everything like that. The natural gas and oil, I don't have to mention that that's very much relates to geology. Now, the other example I want to point out are food and drink without which we couldn't live. And if you think about everything we eat originate, originates from the soil, which in return originates from the rocks. So without geology, you would not have uh, soil. And without soil, we wouldn't have food. Even if you think about the meat, that also derives from the soil because the animals we are eating are eating plants from the from the soil therefore from the rocks and uh, it's very important to understand the soil and the, the food we eat how much it relates to each other like naturally we say that if we eat a lot of vegetables we're gonna get all or all of the minerals necessary for life but just think about if like let's say you eat spinach which has a lot of iron we know but what if the soil the spinach grows in doesn't have any iron because the rocks underneath didn't have much iron in them. So you, you see, we have to understand what kind of soil these plants are growing and how much elements are in it really, other than what we think there is. So it's really important to understand and how do they replenish the elements missing from the soil. So you can understand that the science you're taking is very important for our everyday life and understanding everything which relates to geology. So as you can see it is very logical idea that this semester we are taking geology and we're studying one of the most beautiful science. Of course this is just a joke. All the sciences are very beautiful but geology is my favorite because I'm a geologist. So geology is focusing the earth. So what is earth? Earth is a dynamic, complex planet that has changed continuously si since its formation about 4.6 billion years ago. Now, this is important. You are in a science class, so therefore, whatever your beliefs is on the tests and, and quizzes, you have to use the information which is coming from the class material. So it was formed 4.6 billion years ago. And the changes which are uh, obviously happening on Earth. And the present, present day features of our planet is the result of an inter, of interaction among internal and external systems, subsystems, and cycles. So what is geology? Geology is the science that focusing on the study of Earth, its composition, structure, physical properties, processes that shape it, and its history. 
we have two broad areas in geology, the physical geology, which is the study of all the earth materials like minerals and rocks and their processes, of course, the way they they form, the way they weather and those kind of things. And of course, the other big area is the historical geology. Historical geology uses the principles of phys physical geology, basically what I just mentioned, the rocks, the minerals, their processes, how do they form, and then builds, builds all this knowledge up and it reconstruct and understand the history of what happened when. So you understand which one should be the first one. What do you think? Obviously, the physical geology, because that's where you learn the basics. And then in historical geology, you're just going to build up what happened when. So how does geology affect our everyday life again? We have the natural events, which happens very, very often. you got hurricanes, you got earthquakes, you got volcanoes, tsunamis. Those are easily can affect every day our lives. And then the economy and politics, which is even more so, affects us. Like the oil, the gas prices, even the metal prices, if you think. Because everything we, we use uh, is coming from Earth. So the prices of the, the oil and the gas, you, you feel it every day when you fill up your cars. The metal prices, when you buy cars and you have the cars that are all made by metals and... Uh, these are very important things, if you think, and it really influences every day our lives. So the question is, are we taking care of our home? Are we thinking about the future of the earth and if the next generations will be able to live on it too? This here is our rule for the future of our environment. And this is really important that you understand it. If you have heard about it, you have to know that this is not just something you learn in a science class. Without the sustainable development, we won't be able to survive on Earth. Like you see how the climate change is really messing up everything basically around us. So what is sustainable development? It's a de development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. And this is the or, or common future. And it was established in 1987. So who needs who? This is really important that we watch this movie together and you realize that Earth doesn't need us. We need Earth. Some call me nature. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years, 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you. Or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will. <coughs> I am prepared to evolve. Are you? And here is an amazing example for the future of our food. And then we talk a little bit more about sustainable development. This is an amazing example talking about how can they make food for the future 
especially if we have more people than we have today. So watch it with me. If you want to feed the world in 2050, then the next 40 years we need to produce the same amount of food as we did over the last 8,000 years. And that gives a little bit an indication uh, of the pressure uh, on the food system. We just face a huge challenge with a growing population, with a changing consumption behavior, with the climate crisis. How do you secure your food production? The real secret is the sustainable production. It, it should be with less inputs, less fertilizer, less pesticides, less water. It needs to be sustainable, otherwise we will destroy our planet. Yeah. The security of the food system is one of the world's most pressing challenges. But the story of how this small country became an unexpected food superpower might just have some answers for how we tackle it. Consider this. If everyone on Earth ate the diet of the average American, that would require all the habitable land to be used for agriculture, and we'd still be 38% short. And that's right now. What do we do when there are 2 billion more people? Well, the key is more exciting than it sounds, and that's efficiency. Basically, how do we produce a lot more on the land we're already using, and do it using a lot fewer natural resources? When it comes to sustainable agriculture, one country has seemed to crack the code. Bolstered by a national commitment to produce twice the amount of food with half the resources, the Netherlands has become the world's number two food exporter. There was a very close collaboration between the government, science organizations and the industry. And they started out of a common interest. So they say, okay, yeah, we, we want to go for sustainable production, but everybody was aligned. Everyone involved in the system was aligned and embraced innovation to reach that shared goal. And that has driven efficiency on a level unmatched anywhere else in the world. If there's one place that approach is most clear, it's in their unrivaled greenhouse growing operations. There's a very nice example about tomato, which really gives a good insight in how we want to produce our food in a sustainable way. So if you produce tomatoes in an open field situation in Spain, then you will uh, end up at the end of the growing season with four kilograms per square meter. If you do this in a high-tech greenhouse in the Netherlands at the moment, you will end up with 80 kilograms per square meter, which is 20 times more. But the best part of the story is that the 80 kilograms of tomatoes, we do it with four times less water compared to an open field situation. And water is one of the big challenges that we face. We just had a cup of coffee. Do you know how many liters of water were uh, needed to produce that cup of coffee? Rough guys. 150. So high technology offers really a possibility of producing uh, a lot of food per square meter in a sustainable way. The Dutch lead the world in tomato yield while using a fraction of the water that other countries use. But it's not just tomatoes. Measured by yield per square mile, they're the world leader in the production of chilies and green peppers and cucumbers. Number five for potatoes, onions, and carrots, the list goes on. But the bottom line is they've been able to get so much out of so little. If we are able to produce 80 times more with four times less water, that's, that's great. That's great news, I think. Most people know that greenhouses allow a grower to tweak every little thing. But the Netherlands is taking it to the next level. They've perfected the greenhouse as the ideal environment to continuously test and implement all kinds of ways to optimize growth. From things as simple as testing what hues of LED lights can increase pest resistance and improve nutritional value, to things as crazy as moth-killing drones. So we're, at the moment we don't have any products who can control actually the, the, the moths, and uh, finally they will produce caterpillars, and those caterpillars will, can do a lot of harm to many different crops. Well, that drone is able to detect the, the moth, also to see how, it, how it's flying, and then with his wings, propellers, he just will just uh, crush actually the, the moth. Wow. There's a relentless drive towards innovation to create better and more efficient growing techniques. They've even started taking the human touch completely out of it. Some of the latest tech relies on AI to learn plant behavior and constantly adjust conditions without any input from a farmer. For example, what we're testing in this compartment uh, is a climate computer. So we have different sensors and it's actually, we, we measure the plant activity. And based on the plant activity, the computer is actually controlling the whole climate by itself. Ultimately, the key to solving our global food challenge isn't just in relying on super efficient food producers to carry the weight for everyone else. It's learning from and adopting that technology. 
at the World Horty Center, you see that effort firsthand in an ongoing experiment. They've built basically a greenhouse within a greenhouse. Inside the larger structure, they're able to replicate any climate on Earth to figure out what modifications need to be made to realize the same yields they're getting in the Netherlands and any other country on Earth. We have a cooperative project going on with Colombia, and we can in fact mimic, we can emulate uh, the climate, the current climate conditions uh, in, in Colombia, put their crop in and see uh, how crop behaves under the circumstances that we have in, uh, in Colombia. We can totally flip the seasons around, we, we, we can make it a sunny day on Christmas, we can close the curtains on a sunny day and make it completely dark. I think in the long run, the future of the Netherlands should not be to be a producer for the rest of the world. We should be a developer for the rest of the world. We are the country that will export our knowledge on creating production facilities all over the world. Innovation starts really by bringing all these networks together. In the world we live nowadays, you need to link up with other people. You can't do it on your own. We need to produce more, we need to do it with less inputs and we need to do it better. Thanks for watching. If you like the future of food, stay tuned for our new series, Future of Cities. Subscribe to Freethink now to be the first to see new episodes.